Thank you. Uh, and we're, of course, sitting at the site of the Bevatron, and uh, um, and that's our, our bioepic building going up next door. So um, it's great we could have that we could delay this event until we could have people in person. Uh, it's really important to be able to talk to you about research that isn't COVID. It's nice to be able to talk about things like physics. Uh, we don't often get a chance to recognize properly the work that's gone on before us, so this gives us a chance to do that. And uh, I'd like to start by uh, welcoming a couple of uh, colleagues from the American Physical Society, John Bagger, and they'll be talking later, but theoretical physicist and recently lab director of Triumph, but he's now the CEO for APS, who's here, and Francis Hellman, who is experimental physicist from uh, the lab and uh, the campus here, but who also happens to be in that role as the uh, is, is, uh, uh, current president of APS, which is the rotating leadership position. Um, and uh, there are a few other people. Pierre Doni is there, who is a longtime friend and particle physics colleague, who, of course, was 15 years lab uh, lab uh, deputy director here and then lab director uh, following me at Fermilab. Uh, so as, as Steve Kahn is here, who's the current, uh, uh, no, just about to be Dean of Math and Physical Sciences, I think not for another few weeks. Uh, Lee Schroeder, who is Scientific Director of the uh, Bevelac. Uh, Gregito Advantage, who's here, who's representing as our, our present uh, uh, head of relativistic nuclear collisions, which in some sense is the legacy of that work. Um, and uh, James Simons, who is our uh, former, uh, well, Division Director, Associate Lab Director, and so forth, in Physical Sciences. Uh, Jose Alonzo, who is the Director of the, was Director of the Bevelac and Accelerator Physics, who I've held on many projects, including the ones, as we said, doing these high-intensity blowtorches that cyclotrons are these days. For, uh, and, uh, uh, and Howard Mattis, I'll say, was a leader in instrumentation for nuclear and particle physics, and he and Bob Kahn are the ones who actually proposed the, to us the idea that this would be the right thing to do for the American Physical Society. Um, particle accelerators have had enormous impact on fundamental physics, which is what most of us used them for, but also growing the periodic table for medical diagnosis and therapy. And of course, these X-ray sources like the advanced light source, which are changing science, most notably uh, during the pandemic, a uh, critical role. Um, and we here at Berkeley are on hallowed ground uh, for much of the beginnings of the cyclotron, but much of the development of the accelerators over that time, certainly for circular particle accelerators. Um, so I had, a, I had a great time last weekend reviewing the history of accelerators, uh, which is a favorite of mine anyway, um, uh, reading the, some of the UC Radiation Lab reports about these accelerators. And I'm a longtime physics professor, so I prepared a 50 minute lecture for you today. <laughs> Fortunately, my superb team uh, uh, executed an intervention. Uh, so every undergraduate physics major does a problem, an introductory relativity problem, where he says, OK, what energy proton beam do you need to produce antiprotons on the stationary uh, liquid hydrogen target? And the answer is 5.6 BeV, as we used to call it. And that's, and that's called the Bevatron problem because that's what set the energy of the Bevatron to be 6.2 GeV, as giga electron volts now call it. <clears throat> and the discovery of the antiproton was announced in 1955. And the first thing the lab leaders did was to race to the Atomic Energy Commission, let them know that the cost of the accelerator had been justified. <laughs> uh, and would it have been that the Higgs were so easy at the Large Hadron Collider? <laughs> it took a longer time. Uh, the group led by Emilio Segre and Owen Chamberlain were one of three groups who were struggling to find the antiprotons to show that out of the sea of pions they had, which were the antiprotons, and they did that first, and of course won the Nobel Prize in 59. It's surprising and disappointing that nobody involved in building the accelerator was part of that Nobel Prize, because in the end, it's the accelerator that made it inevitable. I mean, the, uh, frankly, one of the experiments would have found it pretty easy. To be and the Bevatron Science Program gave strong indications that particle physics, the future of particle physics, there was a burst of Nobel Prizes in particle physics over the next 20 years. It was not the antiproton, but the other work going on at the Bevatron that actually gave the hints to that. 
For example, in 53, Gelman, Pais, and Nishijima talked about the, the property of strangeness, this idea that there's a quantum number that gets produced in pairs, which is what were these k mesons were that they were seeing. And of course, that ended up being a large part of particle physics next few years had to do with uh, understanding those quarks, strangeness, and so forth. But at the first time of the Bevatron, you could actually make pion, beams of pions and kaons of these mesons that lasted long enough to do experiments. And that's a lot of, that was the beginning of where high energy physics was going effectively. Um, and getting to, and of course, understanding that when they saw the sea of particles, that these were not the fundamental particles, these were the composites. And that was a point of the way towards the real, real fundamental particles were quarks and gluons and the symmetries that, that led to them. The Bevatron also produced great science because of the innovations in instrumentation that were going on. Louis Alvarez took Donald Glazer's bubble chamber, his idea that won him the Nobel Prize in 1960, and did these large, robust hydrogen bubble chambers that could run and run and run and produce millions of, of uh, photos. And he ran the largest high energy physics group in the country then. It was really, uh, really big science. And they were, you know, lots of people scanning and measuring all those photos, automated measuring machines. And actually, it was not an accident that Art Rosenfeld, who was a member of that group, uh, started collecting the wallet card where we had all the knowledge of energy physics at that time, which became, of course, the particle data group that we now have here. And that was before our Rosenfeld became the sort of godfather of energy efficiency, of course, here at the lab, too. Um, so, and although the Bevatron was one of the earliest proton synchrotrons, uh, it was almost the last of its design. It was already, it was. It was, it was the next generation was a dinosaur, so let's put it of that one. That is to say, because unlike the cyclotron, which had a single magnet that things ran along, the synchrotron was for the first time you actually had a series of magnets in a ring and you ramped up the magnets as the beam went up. But the Bevatron magnets had to be huge because the protons were weakly focused and they were driving all over the place. Uh, the original design had magnets that were four feet high and 14 feet wide. There was a design with that. As he said, they used to say it was big enough to drive a Willie's Jeep through if you put the top, take the top off. <laughs> uh, the final design called for magnet gaps that were one feet high and four feet wide. And that led to this um, massive machine that you see that they're standing on. Uh, so the original Bevatron designer, William Brobeck, and I'll quote here said, the size of the machine would be determined primarily by the availability of funds. <laughs> okay, well, that sets the future of energy physics for the ever since. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and, you know, it's, uh, you know, well, how, how high end does the energy machine the, of the machine need to be? You say, well, how much money do you have? <laughs> As a lab director. <laughs> And the machine, and another quote, the machine was to be located on the grounds of the radiation laboratory above the University of California campus in an area that was prepared by a rather large earth moving operation, this, this, this flat here, cut out of the hill. It had the great advantage of proximity to the university campus, although the site had some disadvantages from the standpoint of cost. Okay, well, that's the history of this laboratory. Everything cost more here, but you know, it's, uh, it's, it's worth it. The cost of the machine, not including shielding or experimental facilities for using the accelerated beam was estimated to be $9.1 million. That's about $90 million in today's terms. So it was actually, it was, a, it was a big investment. So this weak focusing design that led to these, mag these enormous um, uh, magnets, already fortunately in 1952, Cron and Livingston had already published a scheme for strong focusing synchrotrons where you uh, focus and defocus them, keep the beam small so you could then shrink the magnets down and make a much smaller thing as you went up in energy. That was the, the first machines to do that were the uh, proton synchrotron at CERN and the AGS at Brookhaven. And basically that's been the model ever since from there all the way to the LHC has been that. So this was really, there was only this brief time where these synchrotrons existed. So while it, it turns out while all this was going on, the accelerator scientists at Berkeley produced the design of a 200 PEV accelerator to be built in California. But in 1967, the Atomic Energy Commission under Seaboard decided to build the National Accelerator Laboratory in Batavia, Illinois instead, what became Fermilab, uh, putting Robert Wilson in charge. 
uh, the nominal price tag for that 200 BEV design was $348 million or 3.5 billion in today's terms. And that was a physicist's estimate, which means you usually multiply by a factor of two or three. <laughs> Uh, Al Gurso of the Nuclear Chemistry Division proposed building the Omicron Accelerator Complex for less than one-tenth of that, about $24 million here on the site. And Glenn Seaborg at the AZ put that funding in the budget request three years in a row, but the Bureau of the Budget took it out each time. That's what we now know as Office Management Budget, and they're still doing the same thing. <laughs> but when Brick Lab researchers got that proposal rejected, you know, we always have another idea. We always have another proposal. So they came up with the idea of taking the beam from the super Hylac and transporting it to the Bevatron, turning it into the Bevelac. And that was done both for biomedical groups at the time for past heavy ions and for new relativistic heavy ion physics. And uh, McMillan and Lofgren, uh, Edwin McMillan, the lab director, and Lofgren, the Berkeley Brevatron director, liked this idea as a way of keeping the Bevatron going. They did a design in one month for that. And 72, the project was approved with an initial budget of $2 million, extended to $7 million for heavier ions. And the construction was done in two years and started operating, which is a nice thing about those days. <laughs> um, so in, in 1984, a collaboration of researchers uh, with Brick Lab and from GSI in Germany actually were really starting this, what was really a new field. Uh, and uh, the legacy of that field was what eventually worked into uh, becoming uh, working on quark gluon plasma at RIC and BNL is really the legacy of that work. Of course, at that time, they didn't even know what gluons were at that time. So that was just looking at what this nuclear matter was. Uh, by any standards, the Bevatron was a historic facility, one that is in every textbook about fundamental physics. And we're going to hear some more about this today from Kit Chapman, who is actually uh, a, a, a real expert in science communications. Uh, so I, I, I think I'm, in fact, let me uh, introduce that, uh, which is coming up now. So Kit, Kit Chapman is one of the great uh, uh, sort of uh, storytellers of, uh, about physics and about, and wrote a book actually called Super Heavy uh, about these elements. So uh, with that, I think I'm going to, uh, uh, I think we can actually uh, run his, uh, run his video. Well, hello, everyone, and thank you for that warm welcome. Um, I'm very sorry that I couldn't be with you in person today, but I remember the last time I came to Berkeley, I was promised California sunshine and foolishly assumed I wouldn't need a jacket up at the lab. So I've decided to stay here in the comparative warm of England. At least here in London, we can warn you that it's going to get a little chilly. Um, I am also going to speak to you today about some of the key individuals around the Bevatron. And I'm always a little nervous speaking in front of people who knew in person some of the individuals I'm going to talk about. But given I once gave a talk at Berkeley and somehow referred to it as Stanford, I'm pretty certain that you will forgive any slip of the tongue and the fallout will be far less severe. It's always a delight to speak at Lawrence Berkeley because this is not just a place on a hill or a laboratory or pieces of multi-million dollar scientific equipment. This is the birthplace of the entire concept of big science, of research done with big teams, big budgets, and big machines to answer the biggest questions of the universe. Who and what are we? What is reality and what laws does it obey? What is the nature, the fabric of existence? Science is a quest for knowledge, a great expedition on behalf of humanity into the unknown, into uncharted territory only marked here be dragons. And there's no doubt that if it weren't for Berkeley Lab, that expedition would have made far less progress. Now, the architect of the transformation that has led us forward in the past century was, of course, the man who gave his name to this institution, Ernest Lawrence. When he was appointed to the University of California in 1928, or even when Lawrence began drawing what would become the cyclotron on a table napkin in 1929, few could have imagined the integral nature of the spiraling particle accelerator that would become a cornerstone of nuclear physics, or that would win him a Nobel Prize only a decade later. Lawrence actually refused the call from Sweden when he received that Nobel Prize, by the way. He was playing tennis at the time and he wanted to finish his game. 
And if you would appreciate how the cyclotrons growing ever bigger would in the future help save millions of lives, creating radioisotopes to treat cancers or influence trends in science, leading to Berkeley and its alumni starring roles in the Manhattan Project, which spanned the continental United States and at its peak employed 125,000 men and women trying to save lives and end the war early. Berkeley under Lawrence became a school of excellence that granted a wealth of Nobel prizes. And it's small wonder that in 1947, permission was given for a new synchrotron capable of imparting billions of electron volts, the Bevatron we celebrate today. By the time the Bevatron was constructed, of course, Berkeley had taken science beyond what was already considered possible. The first synthetic element, those atoms too unstable to exist naturally on our planet, is often credited as being discovered in Italy. What is rarely mentioned is that its discoverers, dis discoverers Emilio Segre and, uh, and Carlo Perrier, had, had Berkeley to thank for it. They had found the elusive element 43, technetium, in a molybdenum filter from the spare parts Lawrence had sent them. And so Gray's legacy, its highs and lows, are tied intrinsically to Berkeley. He arrived here in 1938, visiting from Italy, only to hear that Jews such as himself were no longer able to teach in Mussolini's dictatorship. Wisely deciding to stay put, he was approached a year later by Edwin Macmillan, who nervously told the Italian, the element discoverer extraordinaire, he thought he had discovered an element heavier than uranium. So Gray didn't actually believe it, and even went so far as to write a paper claiming that the search had been futile. In reality, of course, Macmillan had discovered Neptunium, and soon Berkeley scientists, led by Macmillan and then Glenn Seaborg, would discover the most famous super, uh, transuranic element of all, plutonium, winning Macmillan and Seaborg their own Nobel Prize. So Gray, who discovered his second element, astatine, here at the lab, was integral to Seaborg's efforts during the war. Yet his greatest triumph would come thanks to the Bevatron. In 1955, using this powerful device in its concentrations of high energy, he and Owen Chamberlain were able to experimentally prove the existence of one of the universe's mirror images, the antiproton. It was a demonstration of the importance of fundamental science, of asking questions, not simply improving and applying what has come before. And of course, it saw both of them join the others as Nobel laureates. The final figure I would like to mention, completing a triumvirate of the Bevatron stages before, during, and after its proposed life is of course, Albert Giorso, Al Giorso. An Alameda native, the son of a bootlegger with a gift for tinkering and maverick thinking. Um, he was very famous in his youth for working out how to make a radio broadcast as far as St. Louis. Um, he did it illegally, so he couldn't claim any price. Um, he had become an integral and eccentric part of the lab's quest for new elements. Despite, or perhaps because of, some of the lab safety horror stories I've heard, him throwing around radioactive material inside a tennis ball, uh, racing between the accelerator and the chemical lab in a supercharged Volkswagen Beetle, which is how they discovered Mendelevium, or building equipment out of rat traps, he is today the greatest element discoverer of all time. With no more than a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering, why study for a PhD when you discover the slithers of creation itself? He found 12 elements. These included Californium, Cyborgium, for anagramma fans, that is also Gobertium, uh, Laurentium, and yes, of course, Berkelium. And as the Bevatron began to be superseded by even bigger science in the 1970s, and its replacement never quite materialized, he also played a role in giving it a new lease of life. Linked to the Super Hylac Accelerator, the newly christened Bevelac would become the only machine in the world at the time capable of accelerating every element on the periodic table. It helped us with biological and medical advances and granted us insights into our travels into space and to distant worlds. Now, these are only three of the men and women of multiple races, beliefs, nationalities, and sexualities who worked on the Bevatron and Bevelac. They all represent the pioneering spirit, the hunger that Berkeley's restless and brilliant minds have always possessed. The need to strive to answer 
those big questions I mentioned earlier and etch their names on the very building blocks of matter. We seek to understand the rules of the universe. And yet, as Berkeley continues to show, often the answers come when we dare to challenge those rules and play by our own. Do not see the Bevatron simply as the awesome triumph of science that it is. See it as a testament to how Berkeley welcomes the diverse, the unlikely, the long shot. Whether you're a Bay Area native, an outcast from your own country, or a dreamer who just sees the great big things that science could aspire to be, here you can excel. I would like to leave you with a final thought. In time, as the Bevatron helps show us, we will all be dust. Billions of years from now, we and the Earth and all we know will be consumed in the flesh of a dying star. The atoms that make us shall drift until the heat and the heat and pressure of cosmic forges, we will be remade and reunited once more. Yet as long as humanity exists, the name Berkelium will be with us on chemistry's great roadmap, the periodic table. Lawrence Berkeley will stretch into infinity. And that's why facilities like the Bevatron are so important. This is not just a place, a laboratory, a piece of equipment. It is part of the tapestry of what we know, a beacon of what we stand for, and a symbol of who we might become. Thank you very much. And I will say about just the legacy of this, it's also interesting to see that it was actually at the time of the Bevel Act that Andy Sessler set up basically the present structure of the accelerator division, the nuclear chemistry division, the way it, nuclear science division, not just and physics division, what they are now was part of rearranging things as part of the, at the time of the Bevel Act. And I will say the other thing that's a legacy from that time is actually our our, our, our strength in, in, uh, in actinide chemistry and heavy element chemistry is another thing we have from that. And so Carol Burns, our deputy director, is one of those. Uh, uh, and we, we've cornered the market, good part of the market for the heavy element chemist as well. Uh, and the last part of the legacy actually here is, is what you see here. The fact that we've, uh, re after uh, all these years, uh, Chuck it was Chuck Shank's dream when he was here as director, as, as Pierre is pointing out, that we would reclaim this land for new facilities here. Well, it only took you know 25 years or so to get going on that as they cleaned it up. We now have the integrative genomics building here. That's our bio building next door. And we're gonna have the biogem for uh, biomanufacturing is gonna be one out there once we raise the money for it and get the rest of it cleaned up. And so our deputy, uh, deputy director of operations, Michael Brandt is overseeing that complex. It's a, there, uh, the Department of Energy, about half of the laboratory infrastructure budget for the Department of Energy is going to this laboratory at the moment. So I can't complain about that. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to our, our, our uh, American Physical Society leaders <laughs> and John Bagger and let them uh, talk for, uh, since this is, this is their work. So thank you, Mike. That was an amazing film. We uh, <laughs> <laughs> find a way to preserve it, maybe yeah, yeah. link it to this report somehow, yeah. because I think it really did a beautiful job yeah. talking about the history of this laboratory. <clears throat> anyway, I'm Jonathan Bagger. I'm CEO of the American Physical Society, and I'm really delighted to be here today well, with you, but also with Francis Hellman, who's the uh, 2022 APS president. As many of you know, Francis is a professor of physics and of material science and engineering at UC Berkeley, and also a senior fa faculty scientist here at the lab. So to my mind, the timing of today's presentation really could not have been better. So APS is one of the world's largest organizations of physicists, representing some 50,000 members across universities, laboratories, and industry. And we're brought together, really, by our shared interest in our mission, which is to advance and diffuse the knowledge of physics for the benefit of all. So in 2005, the APS Committee on Historic Sites was formed. It was formed to recognize places of historical importance to the physics community. By designating such sites, APS honors scientific accomplishments and celebrates people and places that have shaped the direction of our 
The Committee on Historic Sites consists of six experts in the history of physics. After soliciting nominations from the community, they select only a few places each year to designate as APS historic sites. So we're very grateful that 2001, led by Virginia Trimble from UC Irvine, but we're very grateful for the work they did that led to us being here together today. But from a very, very competitive pool of nominations, the committee selected Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, site of the Evatron and about the Fevelac, as just one of two places to be recognized this year. The choice of Berkeley Lab is particularly appropriate since almost 300 APS members considered this laboratory to be their professional home. And almost a third of those members are distinguished as APS fellows. Our organization benefits greatly from all of the members across the nation, but especially here at this lab. So over the years, many of your colleagues have devoted their time and their expertise to serve on our committees and in leadership roles. So we at APS thank them and we thank this laboratory for all that you have done. Thank you. Thank you also for arranging this very, very special event today. Now I'll turn the mic over to Francis. We'll say a few words and then present the flag. Um, thank you, John. Um, and it is quite wonderful to be here for this event. Um, as John mentioned, I'm not only the president of the APS, uh, I am also a faculty member and a staff scientist here at Berkeley. So it's particularly joyous to be here, to be able to be here to present this plaque. A um, couple of historical notes, and I am not going to be as eloquent as Kip Chapman, but there you have it. So I would still want to make a few comments. Uh, we were gathered in a place called Berkeley, and I don't know how many of you know this history, but shortly after President Lincoln signed the Morrill Act, which established the land-grant colleges, a trustee of the Cal College of California, which is what it was then called, Frederick Billings, suggested the site carry the name of 18th century Irish philosopher George Berkeley, which is actually traditionally pronounced Berkeley, yeah. um, who was the inventor of something called subjective idealism, which you are welcome to look up. Uh, it's an interesting subject. Um, so an interesting history from that side. The other half of the name Lawrence, of course, we've already heard, but in 1928, Elmer Edgar Hall, who was the UC Berkeley Physics Department Chair, uh, succeeded in recruiting a young faculty member away from Yale by the name of Ernest Orlando Lawrence. And just as a note, at that time, the starting professor's salary was about $3,000 a year. So I'm not quite sure. I'm not sure that that keeps up with inflation or gone beyond that, but at any rate. Lawrence went on, of course, to design, build, and patent his first cyclotron in 1934, work for which he received the 1939 Nobel Prize. And that first cyclotron was, uh, cyclotron was made out of brass wire and sealing wax. I've seen it, and we have it down in the physics department. I don't remember actually noticing the sealing wax, but I dare say it is there. Uh, it cost about $25. Mm. those dollars. Um, and that was followed by, as you've heard, an increasingly larger and more powerful cyclotron and synchrotron designs, culminating in 47, when Lawrence received the funds to build the Bevatron, which later led to the Bevelac. The cyclotron was built in what was originally known as the radiation or rad lab. Again, I think a history you all know. Uh, it's interesting, in the 50s and, and then in the 70s, there was a series of votes by the UC regents, which led to the name name of the Lawrence Berkeley Lab or Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, the name that we all know this by today. So following in Lawrence's legacy, the Bevatron and the Bevelac, more specifically, the scientists, engineers, and staff who built and used these made many, many major contributions to accelerator physics, to nuclear physics, to particle physics, to studies of space-related radiation damage, medical research, and clinical radiotherapy. It is quite a remarkable history that we, that, that we stand on right here. Um, the APS's committee members had long known of the many important contributions made to these many, many branches of physics by the Beveton and the Bevelac, and we're very pleased to be able to acknowledge its historical significance. 
Although the Bevatron and Bevelac machines are no longer here, Berkeley Lab and the site continue their remarkable innovations in this tradition of collaborative team science that yielded those important discoveries. And I think it is particularly fantastic and memorable that we honor this history at the very moment that their space is being reconfigured into future scientific discoveries. And there's something kind of remarkable about that timing that we're here honoring at this moment, the historical legacy while we're in this new building here and standing next to that building and envisioning a, a further building. And I, you know, I just think that's a, um, it makes me proud to be giving these, these, we honor the past while looking to the future. Um, so I am quite sure that I'd speak for all of us in saying that we watch in anticipation the new discoveries from this place in the years and decades to come. <clears throat> um, the energy and environment work that will be carried out here in these new facilities will, we are sure, play a large role in sci solving the scientific challenges of our time. We are all standing on the shoulders of the giants from those early years, and today's event recognizes that history. Um, so. Without further ado, I would like to invite LVNL Director Mike Wiggle forward, and we're now going to proceed with the, the ceremonial aspects. So, I will here unveil the plaque. So, as President of the American Physical Society, it is my pleasure to present this plaque, which has a very small font, but I'll read it out loud for my pages. <laughs> Uh, on this site in 1955, after completion of the Babatron, Chamberlain, Segre, Weigand, and Ypsilantis reported the discovery of the antiproton. In the 1960s, bubble chambers here revealed many new particles, evidence for SU3 symmetry, now known to be the signature of the three lightest sparks. Later, Joroso conceived and Grinder built the Bevelac by merging the Bevatron and the Superhylac into the world's first relativistic heavy ion accelerator. This accelerated ions from protons to uranium. Remarkable accomplishment, sorry, editorializing. <laughs> 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 Launching high energy heavy ion physics and clinical radi radiotherapy with heavy ion beams. So here is this beautiful plaque, which no site plan this is going to be installed. Do, do you know where it's going to be installed? Outside the front door of the IGB. Outside the front, front door, door of this building. Of this yeah. building. Yeah. So, okay. So, and, and we with, have some signing. And now we have some signing to do. So next, we are going to sign okay. these. Side the right side. Side. Oh, good point. Uh, how do we do this? There's usually a name underneath. Yeah. I don't know. I'm not sure. Uh, you take the left. I'll take the right. Perfect. Yes, I'll perfect. Right right well. okay. Great. So the, uh, as a note, the reason there are two of these is one of these certificates stays here with the Berkeley Lab, and the other is officially added to the APS Historic Sites Registry. Great. Great. And now with that, the next step is we I'd like to bring John back up here. John, you guys? And I think we're supposed to take yet more photos. Yeah, so, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yes, sure. Oh yeah, Mike didn't know. Let's see. Okay. You're allowed. It's your class, actually. How about this? The projector was okay. As I say at this point, he's now the director. Yes. Yeah, so, <laughs> like, where do you want us? <laughs> right there. Because I was worried about the projector on the end, but it's not there. So actually, you can both go a little bit away. There, Mike, up a little. There. Perfect. One, two, and good luck. Awesome. Should sorry one. Not to oh, not to be the director here, but no, please, please. hold. Well, want to hold this up? Your you can do that. Yeah. <laughs> One more. Perfect. Perfect. Excellent. And now I turn this back over to you. Okay. So for closing remarks. So anyway, let me. Uh, I I think we take a moment to give a round of applause for all of the people who contributed to this program over the years. Some of whom were with us. Uh, many who who were not and are past, but I think we owe it to all of them to give them a round of applause for their work. Uh, uh, I'm glad you all could be with us today. We're gonna have some uh, little bit of refreshments out here. So it's uh, enjoy our, our building. And so, uh, and thanks again for coming. Thanks so much. Bye.